Okay, so we're in the start of the new year, and I am just just want to say from the right from the start, I am. It is not lost on me the significance that I am standing here on the first Sunday of the year at Link Church. I've never done that before. For me, this is a great privilege and an honor. Why? Because I believe our words create worlds. And so the words God has given me today, I believe will shape a world in us for this new year. And so there is a great privilege and a great joy that I get to bring something that I believe will shape something for our community this year. And so my prayer is that your hearts would be open that you would be ready and willing to receive what I believe is a fresh, challenging, and exciting word for us as a community this year. Amen? Are you ready? Great. So why is the start of something so significant? Why are firsts so important? In the Bible, firsts are emphasized because they establish a precedent or a pattern that's carried through the rest of the story. So what we're actually doing today is we you and me together online, hello, are establishing a precedent for how we gather in 2024. We're setting in motion a pattern that's not just, this is not just any given Sunday. I believe, and this is a Sunday of influence and honor. You are not here by chance. In fact, I wanna go so far as to say, I don't believe it was your good idea to get up this morning. I believe the Holy Spirit ushered you to this place because this is a Sunday of great significance and we're, gonna, we're gathering with intention, placing this first in the highest order of priority, giving it rank because we know that this makes us strong. And so knowing the weight of this moment, I've been asking the question, what is it that God would inspire and ignite in us as a people? There are many things many things we could talk about at the start of the new year. And yet, what is it that God wants for this community? You can go and listen to many other preachers and what they have to say about 2024, and that is awesome. But if you've chosen to be a part of this community at this time, in this year in 2024, I believe this is a word for us, amen? And so this year, as Dylan and I have been praying and talking about what, what are we believing for as the leaders of this community, of this people? Our hope and our prayer, we believe, is that God is asking that we would raise, release, and call forth big people. Say big people. Big people. Big people who are secure, who are front-footed, faithful, servant-hearted people, people who are passionate, stiff, green passionate, kind, brave, courageous, convicted people, thoughtful and generous people, consistent people, selfless people, mindful and confident people, big people. Maybe not big in size, but big in heart and big in spirit, amen? And for some of you, I know you're hearing that and you're like, okay, well, who, who are these big people and how do I become such a person? What are they? What is a big person? I believe big people are kingdom people. And kingdom people, they choose, it is our choice, to live in God's family by his system and his economy. Amen? Can I say that again? Can, I like that. Do that. That's awesome, great. Big people are kingdom people and kingdom people live in God's family. They choose it to live within God's family by his system and his economy. And so today I'm gonna to be talking about what it means to live in God's family. I'm gonna be talking about sonship, what it means to carry a spirit of sonship. And then we're gonna be talking about what it means to live by God's system, a system that is not the same as the system of the world, a system of surrender. And we're gonna be talking about what it means to live by God's community, uh, economy, an economy of sowing, amen? Amen? Right. So if you're with me, let's go to our first idea, big people get sonship. Now this is a very talked about, perhaps misunderstood concept within scripture, but I want to help us by simplifying it today to show you that it is available for all of us. It is not some far off, far off concept for theologians. Amen? The Bible is for ordinary, everyday people who would pick it up, read it, and take hold of the promises in Jesus' name. Amen? Big people get sonship. They live with a deep knowing and understanding of who they are and who they belong to. 
I'm going to read a few scriptures today throughout this message. I want to encourage you, they are going to be on social media and stories. If you're not on social media, you can subscribe to our email. There are many opportunities to obtain such scriptures, or you can take notes right now. Ooh, that was awful. <laughs> it's so good to know that we're all just figuring life out, right? Okay? So I want to encourage you, can you take all of these scriptures Put them somewhere that you can see them. Put them on the fridge. Put them on your cupboard. I don't know. Have them somewhere that you can read them every day so they, are, they become imprinted in the fabric of your heart and your soul. Because I promise you, if you do that, they will begin to shape the way that you live your life. They will begin to shape the way that you make decisions, the relationships that you step into. Scripture has the ability to do that. It's that powerful. And so Galatians 3 verse 26, learn this off my heart. In Christ Jesus, you are children of God through faith. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Sonship. John 1 verse 6 to 13. I want us to read it together. Let's go to the New Testament. Verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. So he's talking about Jesus. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming to the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, He's talking about the Israelite people, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right, say the right, to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Regardless of the circumstances surrounding your conception, your birth, your parenting, your lack of parenting, you are a child of God. For those who receive Christ, that means you've called upon the name of Jesus, believed in his finished work to save and complete us. For those of us who surrendered our humanity to his divine authority, he gives the right to be called children of God. Amen? sons and daughters of God. He does that. We don't earn that. He does that. Rights are an interesting concept to me. We have many so-called rights, yeah, in the world, right? Right. <laughs> we have the right to clean running water. We have the right to f shelter over our head. We have the right to um, be cared for. I don't know all of them off my heart. I'm not one who reads the Constitution. I know that in this nation, we live with the right to education. We have the right to freedom of speech. We have the right to vote. We have the right to uh, choose our religion. Yes? But let's not be fooled. These rights are not certain. Amen? They're not a given. They can be snatched from us at any stage. If someone decides they don't like that humans should have that right anymore. We can only hold onto and claim one right with absolute certainty. And that is the right to be called children of God. And we read in John 10 verse 28 and 29, he says this, I give them. Now Jesus is talking here. I want to say when you read the Bible, take, um, special, pay special attention when Jesus speaks. There's great authority to the things that he says. And he says here, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who's given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. This is Jesus and he's giving us a promise of absolute certainty, absolute security. And what he gives, no one can take away from you. You have a right to be called a child of God, a son or a daughter of the most high God. Big people live from this identity of sonship. I am a child of God. Therefore, I have full access to everything the Father has promised me. Yeah. 
J.R. Packer in his book, Knowing God, says if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship, his prayers, and his whole outlook on life, it means he hasn't understood Christianity very well at all. It is so important that we ask Holy Spirit this year to give us a divine revelation of sonship of what it means to be called a child of God. Big people are kingdom people who live as a part of God's family. As Christians, the Bible tells us we've been adopted into God's kingdom family, right? You may have read that. In Ephesians 1, it says, Praise be to God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in all the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love, He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in according with his pleasure and his will. That was God's decision. This is not my good idea. This is not my clever teaching. God decided that we would be adopted into his family. And I believe there are far too many Christians living like they're foreigners and outsiders, like they don't have a place at the family table of God. This year, I believe God is calling us to step into the identity of big people, people who believe that they're part of God's family, that they've been adopted into his family as sons and daughters of the most high God. Um, I have amazing friends who have adopted children. One of the greatest lessons I've learned from being friends with these really big people, and they are big people, is that adoption is deeply spiritual. And I once remember saying to her, um, you know, it's so amazing that you've given these children such an amazing future and opportunity to be part of your family. And, you know, their lives could have been so radically different. I think it's amazing what you've done. And she very gently looked at me and said, and helped me understand that these are her children. Adoption was just the way that they arrived home. And just like I naturally birthed my children and they they are now part of our family, she and her husband went through a legal process and what was born from that moment was a family too. Her children, if you meet them, and you should meet them, come and ask me who they are afterwards, I don't wanna put them on the spot. They do not live with an outsider mindset. They are just as much a part of that family as their biological child is. They carry their name, they carry their talents, I don't know how that works. They carry their values, they carry their identity. It is is the most supernaturally incredible thing I have been able to witness with my eyes. But it's given me such an incredible picture of what it means to be adopted into the family of God. And when God adopts us in and he gives us an identity of him, how we live that out, secure, whole, knowing whose we are, knowing who we belong to. And I wonder what it would look like if we all lived our lives, made our decisions, stepped into the things that are set before us, the friendships we chose, the homes we built, what that would look like if we believe, truly believe that we are part of God's family by right. If you look briefly at the concept of sonship in the Old Testament, you'll see that it's, linked prim- it's not linked primarily to paternity. It's actually all about the family identity and vocation. So it was all about what your father did. So if your father was a baker, then you must become, Dubsy, what happened? A baker. <laughs> a baker's son. <laughs> Uh, if your father is a farmer, then you would become a father and so on. Yes, you get it? So your identity, your name, your vocation, and your inheritance were all wrapped up in the Father. And I wonder what it would look like, how we would live, the boldness and courage we would perhaps move from if we knew with certainty that our identity, our value, our vocation, our inheritance was all wrapped up in the Father. Would you take more risks? I would. Would you refocus certain relationships or perhaps, uh, you know, partnerships because you think that you need him. You think that you need them, but actually everything's wrapped up on him. Jesus came to, to, he had one overarching purpose on the planet 
And that was re to reveal the word father to the people. For, for, for years, they had known God as many things. They knew him as almighty. They knew him as the shadow. They knew him as the creator, but they did not know him as father. And he came to reveal to them the Father so that they could rise above the, the smallness of what they were a part of and become big people. And I love that Jesus teaches us that we can be great students of his life. We can be brilliant followers of his ways. We can even be expert disciples. But at the heart of it, if we miss the fact that we are children of God, that we carry a spirit of sonship, that we are adopted into his family, then we miss out on the primary purpose of what Jesus came to do here, to restore us to the Father. Amen? So big people get sonship. Big people live by God's system. So we all live in the world, right? Some of us, not. Some of us are living in some outer aura of space, and I'm just gonna bring us all down for a minute. All of us live in the world, physically, yes. The world, even if we don't choose it, has systems that govern and dictate how we get by. As humans on Earth, we quickly learn these world systems. We learn how to get what we want. We learn how to get ahead. We learn how to achieve. We learn how to be influential. We're told we can have it all, so we hustle. We're told we can do it all, so we juggle. That failure isn't an option, that weakness is not for us, and so we subscribe to that because it's a system of the world. Even from young, clever, we learn the strategies that help us to get our own way. It's a system of the world. But the kingdom of God operates differently to this world. And it is mo it's most often very difficult to understand. It doesn't make sense half the time. And it can seem wildly unfair. Big people live knowing that there's room enough for all of us to come alive in the kingdom of God. Amen? We are not primary schoolers going after the sportsman, sportswoman of the year, academic of the year, one and only prize. We've moved past that. We realize that there is room enough. The kingdom of God is spacious. All of us can step into our God calling and anointing in Jesus' name. There is room for everyone to thrive. I am not waiting for someone else to figure that out for me anymore. I'm also not gonna keep putting off realizing my full God potential because I'm paralyzed by comparison. I would love you to join me. Thank you. <laughs> You're awesome. We must talk. The best thing I have done, honestly, and this is just a vulnerable, you know, throwaway for you to take home and think about. The best thing I've done uh, in this transition from 2023 into 2024 was to take an extended break of social media. I had no idea, no idea at all how much this space was, was really stealing my joy because of comparison and jealousy. And I would never have said I'm a jealous person. I'm like, whatever, I love everybody. We must all thrive, we must all be happy. But I had no idea how spending so much time looking at all the things and all the people was governing my thought life. And here's the thing, social media is not evil. It's not, it's just not real. It works on a system created by the world where we work for approval and our acceptance. We showcase our lives for likes and hearts and followers. And for most of us, me included, we live knowing that we are fully accepted by Jesus, that we have nothing to prove, nothing we can do or say could affect the way his, that he is towards us, his attitude towards us. Yet a couple of scrolls later, we're questioning why we even exist. And what is for us? Why can't I look like that? <laughs> what do we have to offer? How did, I, how, come, how did they land up with that holiday? Why am I the one working so hard and everyone else looks like they're on the beach? Amen? I know you've done it. You may as well just be free. <laughs> be free, come as you are, we say here. I know that I'm not the only one. And maybe social media is not an issue for you. You're sitting here, you're going, Oh, not an issue. I'm not even on social media. Maybe you have an issue with real people. <laughs> yes. 
Okay, so now if you canceled yourself out of that one, let me tell you online, you may have a issue with real people. And let me tell you, we all have real people in our lives. A family member, a circle, a club, a group where you've never quite found yourself at home. Never quite felt like you've belonged. People who perhaps bring out the worst in you, making you do things that you wake up the next day covered in shame and you just don't know how to get over it. You don't know how to get by. Maybe you don't have an issue with social media. Maybe you're sitting here going, I really don't have an issue with people. That's awesome. You're amazing. But I would encourage you this year, before you set your fitness goals, yes, before you set all the other smart goals, and I'm not against goals, they do direct where we end up. But before you do that, I want to encourage you to take a look inside because there is gonna be something that's holding you back from moving into the fullness of life and joy and peace that God has for you. My hunches, whatever that thing is, it works according to the world system. Deal with it. Deal with it. Ruthlessly. Big people, kingdom people, they live by God's system and they reject the system of the world that demands that we must work for our value and our approval. And the system of the kingdom is a system of surrender. So back to front. People who live by surrender say, I put myself, all of myself, in your power, God. You can have my talent. You can have my knowledge. You can have my ego. You can have my best attempts to pull off anything great. You can have my frustration. You can have my jealousy. You can have my social media. You can have it all. I am all yours. Big people are secure. Big people look at 24 and say, you know what? I am not good enough to pull this off and make this year happen. (laughs) In fact, I'm actually pretty rubbish on my own. I need Jesus. We need Jesus. And we need enthusiastic, life-giving, spirit-filled people around us who are gonna champion our lives. Kingdom people approach a new year from a different vantage point. They know what they want. I know what I want. I know all the things, I know all the goals. But big people ask the question, what do you want me to become, God? Is it perhaps different to what I see for my life? What will I surrender and what does radical obedience look like? I surrender all of myself to him. I place all of my dreams, my ambitions, my desires, my habits and my frustration in your hands. I place my inability to get it right in your hands. I place all of my dysfunction in your hands. 1 Peter 5 verse 6 and 7, another scripture, learn it. Get it into your spirit. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety onto him because he cares for you. Without surrender, we will live consistently overextended in our humanness. And this year, I'm committed to surrender more than ever. Less of me, God. Get me out of the way. Get me out of the way. I wanna try less and I wanna train more. Train in obedience. Train in surrender. Because he promises, church, he promises us in scripture that he will take care of us. Humble yourself, come to him, cast all of it, him, all of it on him and he will take care of you. And the third thought I have for you this morning is big people live by God's economy. So big people are kingdom people. They live in God's family, by his system and his economy. They live with absolute certainty that everything is from God, everything. Everything we have is from him and through him. He's gifted to us, he's gifted it to us and he's entrusted it to us. So I wanna take us to Deuteronomy 8 verse 10. We're gonna read it together. And what Moses is doing in the scripture is he's teaching the Israelite people about God's economy and he's helping them. He's giving them instructions. He's showing them all the promises, but he's giving them an instruction within that and a warning so they can learn because it's all about God's economy. Amen? Verse 10. 
When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who has brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. Wow. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known, to humble and test them so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me, but remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Amen? This scripture is powerful, 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 because Moses tells them, if you read it, go and read it, go read Deuteronomy 8, there's a list of the things he, God promises his people. And there's the key instructions. Remember God and bless God. Those are the two things he tells them. And then he says to them, because he warns them, he says, there's gonna, be, there's gonna come a time when you look at everything that you have and you say, in your heart, maybe not to the people, in your heart, you're like, wow, look what I did. Look what I made. Look what I built. It was me. It was my talents. It was my power. It was my ability at this point, church, when you catch yourself, because he's telling us it, it happens, when we catch ourselves with our hearts claiming what we have done, this is a warning sign. And Moses says, at that point, be humble and remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability. That word ability in other translations is the word power. It's the word roach, and it's vigor, it's strength, it's capacity, it's, it's substance, it's means. It's God who gives you the capacity, the means, the substance, the vigor, the strength to produce wealth. It is He who establishes the covenant. Notice, it is He, it is He, it is He, it is He. It all starts with God. It's all about Him, it's all from Him. And He reminds them that it is God who makes the way. It's God who has given you what you needed to get where you are today. Big people live by God's economy. So in other words, friends, we do not cower to a failing economy in this world. And it is failing. We do not lose sleep when the interest rates rise and continue to rise and the fuel prices increase, which affect everything else. We don't lose sleep because we're big people. And Psalm 4 verse 8 tells us that in peace I lie down and sleep because you alone will keep me safe. We can put our heads down and rest knowing that He will take care of it because we don't live by the economy of this world. Big people know that God is going to supernaturally move outside of our human manufacturing. He will give us the opportunities, the open doors, the talents, the breakthroughs, the gifting that bring the wealth, that bring provision, that bring prosperity. That are, those are part of God's promises within Scripture. Amen? There's a kingdom economy and it's got nothing to do with buying and selling. I buy, I get. I pay, I get. He, uh, if I do that, He must do this. If people see this, then I'll get that. I did this, I deserve that. We do not have to play a bargaining game with God. You know why? Because Jesus already did that. In Gethsemane, He got down on His knees and He begged God for another way begged him, take this from me. There must be another way. Surely if I do that, something else can happen. The father remained silent. You know the story. And what did Jesus do? He made a trade to pay the highest price so that we can live in the fullness of his freedom, provision, protection, healing, and wholeness in Jesus' name. Big people live by an economy of sowing and reaping. 
They sow seeds because they know it has nothing to do with them. They sow because they know who the source is. We're not the source, we're the conduit. And big people have a heart to sow because they believe in generational impact. Big people sow because they're connected to the heart of the Father. And seeds take a long time to grow. I planted sunflower seeds in like July. Honestly, I am yet to see a plant. I think one. I think I planted literally 10,000 seeds and literally not one. I, I actually, we need to talk about it. And I've waited and waited and, and I know, friends, I know that waiting is hard. And, I, and the waiting actually, it's the waiting that can trip us up. There are so many lessons to be learned along the way, but farmers will tell you, really good ones, that waiting is sacred. Much can be tended, nurtured, and attended to in the wait. And big people sow despite the delay. They show, they, they sow without the f- full picture. And they bless God by living big, generous lives. I wanna tell you a little story. Um, so this this holiday, please don't go and talk to my children about the stories I tell them. I do ask their permission, but it just, it can be, it can be overwhelming for a child to be asked 800 times how they feel about X. Thank you. So one of my children, whose name should not be mentioned, actually I'm gonna tell you, it was Joel. Um, he's little, so it's okay. Joel, Joel is very competitive. And Joel does not like to lose. And I have a struggle with watching people lose in a manner that is poor. (laughs) I really struggle. I think it is horrendous. And so I Googled how to help a child learn to lose well. And one, (laughs) one of the suggestions that came up from the wonderful Google is to play many, many board games or games and and then to allow the child to become accustomed <laughs> to losing and then to train them in the losing how to do that better. Um, the problem is he's very good. <laughs> so it's taken a lot longer and I've played about 50,000 games of Uno. Anyway, uh, it has actually been semi-effective. We're still growing. But one of, the, one of these days I was playing Uno with Joel and he was playing with one of his cousins. And you know, as a parent, as a mother particularly, you, you just know when something's gonna go pear-shaped. You can see it, like you know when the milkshake's gonna spill. Watch the milk, oh, okay, the milkshake's gone. And anyway, I, could, I watched this game going on with the cousin and I thought, this is not gonna end well for Joel. It's gonna be a bad night. So we should, I should intervene. Anyway, I watched it going on and it, it really, it got bad. He started, he does this like, and the tears and the whole posture changes. And I'm like, oh, okay, come on. Anyway, at this point, I don't know what made me do this, but I picked him up in the middle of the game. I put him on my lap and I whispered into his ear and I said, Joel, Joel, I am on your team. I am here to help you win. You may not win this game, but you are gonna win something in your heart. I'm not gonna force you to stop crying because I know this is really hard for you. You can cry all you want, but we're gonna finish this game because I am not gonna let you quit because I know something that you don't know. You were born for big things. You are gonna be a big person and I am gonna help you become that sometimes you're gonna lose and that's okay. But in the end, you always win. And I said to him, every time you don't give up, you win. Every time you congratulate someone who wins the game, you win. Every time you do this, even though you're so mad, you wanna throw the cards across the room, you win. When you don't throw the cards across the room, you win. So lift up your head. And when you can't, I'm gonna lift it up for you. Play another card, boy. I'm right here. And you know what, he did lose. (laughs) And he did cry and I took him and I tucked him into bed because sometimes there's just no consoling a man who's lost. (laughs) In Jesus' name, there's just some battles that we will not have victory to here on earth, all the answers, but we just, 
we love them. We love you guys. I love men. They're fascinating. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, it was probably a morning was so late and I was sitting having a coffee outside and I was thinking through this moment because I think my family watched me do this thing with Joel and they thought, whoa, this woman, crazy. Um, and I was thinking about this moment and I really, I felt God smile, like a physical, beautiful, big smile over my life. There are not many moments as a parent where I have felt like I've got done a good job. Honestly, most times I feel like I'm just winging it and my children are remarkable. It is by the grace of God, I don't know. I don't know how, but anyway, I felt God's pleasure. And I felt, I felt in my spirit, good job, Tess. You just showed him the essence of who I am. I am with you in every moment, every battle. I am on your team. I am here to help you win. You may not win every battle, but you have already won the war in me. I'm here to set you up for victory every time. Can you stand? I'm gonna speak something over you as we continue to worship and as we trust God to grow us and raise us and release us to become big people who can sit in the game and continue to play when the chips are down because we know that He is fighting for us on our side, that He has gone before. So I wanna say to you, church, keep going. In 2024, stand up a little taller, stand up straighter, lift your head held high, knowing that you are a part of God's family, that you can subscribe to a system that is not the way of the world, that there is an economy of God that you can live by, that that you can put your head down and sleep, knowing that He has done it all. So keep going, play another card keep showing up. Come to church. Be a part of God's family, even when you don't feel like it, even when the sun is shining and the beach looks better, even when it's raining and you don't want to get out of bed, even because the night before looked a little shady and you don't feel like you can show up in church, you want to come with your head down low. I want to encourage you to come anyway. Keep coming. Keep pressing in. You're my child, says God. You're my son. You're my daughter. And that is your right. No behavior, no person, no habit, Nothing can keep you from me. It is your right and I have given it to you in Jesus' name. So take hold of that. Surrender your ego. Surrender it. Surrender your pride. Surrender yourself. Surrender your way. Surrender it all to Him. You do not need to prove yourself to anyone. No one here is sitting in this church or in heaven going like tick, 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 follow like tick, tick, no one. You are valuable and approved of in Christ Jesus before you opened your eyes in the morning, before the fabric and fiber of the world was established. You, you were the apple of God's eye. Surrender yourself to that, to that system. Keep sowing. Church, keep sowing. Don't dam up. Don't hold it in. Keep sowing. The the Bible tells us that the world of the generous gets larger and larger. Keep sowing. Open your hands. Live by God's economy. It's all from in Him anyway. Do not be threatened by the economy of the world. Don't Don't get distracted by all the glittery things. Don't get scared. Don't be scared. Do not be afraid, says God. I am with you. I am I am with you in this game. Stop focusing on what everyone else has around you and focus on me. Build a life that has generational impact. You are big people. The title of my message this morning is you were born for big. That is the word over you in 2024 and may you receive it by the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen in Jesus' name. Let's worship.